funding for election 2018 AETN debates is provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Debate Week on the Arkansas Educational Television Network, AETN. We feature tonight the candidates for Congress in the 2nd District. In alphabetical order, the nominees tonight are Representative French Hill, the Republican incumbent, Joe Ryan Swafford, the Libertarian Party candidate, and State Representative Clark Tucker, the Democratic nominee. Our candidates tonight will be questioned by a panel of Arkansas journalists, Jesse Turnur of KARK, Steve Brauner, an independent journalist, and Wesley Brown of Talk Business and Politics. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Each will have two minutes to respond to a question. Rebuttals are limited to one minute, and at the conclusion of the debate, each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. The order of opening statements, questioning, rebuttals, and closing statements was determined prior to the broadcast at a drawing in which the candidate or their representative participated. And our timekeeper this hour is Angela Cook of AETN. And with that, our first opening statement tonight, Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Steve. Thank you also to our panel. <clears throat> Thank you to Mr. Swafford and Congressman Hill for deciding to be here today, to those of you in the audience and those of you at home. Most importantly, I want to thank my wife and our two children, our son Ellis, who just turned nine, and our six-year-old daughter, Mary Frances, because they, they're who keep me going. I'm Clark Tucker. I'm a proud, lifelong Arkansan, born and raised right here in central Arkansas and graduated from Central High. My family and this community are fundamental enough to who I am that when I graduated from law school in Fayetteville, I immediately moved home because I felt called to give back to the community that helped to raise me. For the last four years, I've served in the legislature where I'm proud of the hard work I put in to put families and people first, protecting access to health care for hundreds of thousands of Arkansans, improving the quality of education for our kids, helping entrepreneurs follow their dreams, and standing up for our veterans. Even though Democrats are in the minority, I was able to get a lot done. I have learned that if you work hard, if you respect and listen to people with perspective different than you, and you attack our problems instead of each other, then you can actually get something done for the people that we represent. Unfortunately, that's not what we've seen out of our current Congress, and it's not what we've seen out of our current Congressman French Hill. You see that in the fact that he's a reliable party line voter and in the type of campaign that he's chosen to run this year. From the divisive and false attacks relentlessly against my family and me, they're straight out of a Washington playbook, written by special interests and party bosses. And every time you hear the name Nancy Pelosi or bigger government, whether it's on TV at home or during the forum tonight, that's just proving my point. I know that the people of Central Arkansas are smart enough not to fall for the politics of the past, that we want to put that aside and actually have someone who stands up for us on critical issues like health care protections for people with pre-existing conditions. That puts people first for a change, and I hope to have that kind of chance to be that kind of congressman for the people here in Central Arkansas. Mr. Tucker is thanked. Mr. Swafford. Yes. My name is Joe Ryan Swafford, and I just want to thank AETN for this opportunity and thank the voters of Arkansas for this privilege to run for this great job title and to represent you in Washington. Like most Americans, I come from a blue collar working class family. My background is in education, economics, small business, and local government. Some of you may be wondering what a libertarian is. That's the question I get most often. And it's pretty simple. We're fiscally conservative and socially we believe you have the right to do whatever it is you would like to do, so long as it doesn't infringe upon the rights of another. I'm not going to take up a lot of your time today, and I'm going to keep my answers very short and concise, because I believe that we have simple solutions to complex problems. With that said, I'm very excited to be here, and uh, I look forward to exploring the solutions to all the problems that the Democrats and Republicans have caused us. The gentleman is thanked. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Steve. It's good to be with everybody tonight. I, too, want to add my thanks to UCA and AETN for hosting this debate. Appreciate it very much. Appreciate the audience being here. 
I ran for Congress uh, four years ago with an idea that I would take my 35 years of business experience, my experience in economic policy working for President Bush 41, and that I would bring that together to look for common sense solutions to all the problems that ail us. Back when I was running in 2014 for the first time, I talked about the wet blanket of the Obama regulatory regime over the economy, the need to do tax reform to get faster economic growth. Because under the Obama administration, we had low economic growth, 1.8% uh, on average. So when I went to DC, that was my priority. And we've removed that uh, regulatory wet blanket. We've cut taxes for families. We've allowed people to keep more of their own money. We've removed uh, the business burden that has blocked uh, our businesses from being able to bring profits back to the United States, something that Democrats and Republicans worked for for 30 years, and we removed that double taxation. So I'm taking that business experience, my fact that I was a former chamber chairman, a Rotary president, and I'm asking for the voters to support me again, to go back to Washington, to fight for our veterans, to fight for a solution to affordable health care where we actually do protect those with pre-existing conditions and lower prices for everybody across the board, whether you are getting your care through uh, Medicaid or through a group plan, and fight to fix our broken immigration system. Those are principal issues that I've been disappointed that we have not gotten done in this most recent Congress. And with that said, I've also been proud that I've passed four bills and signed those into law with two different presidents. So I'm fighting for the people of Arkansas. Mr. Hill, thank you. Our first question tonight goes to Mr. Hill, and it's from Mr. New. Gentlemen, the Me Too movement has been highlighted by the recent SCOTUS confirmation hearings for U.S. District Judge Brett Kavanaugh. As a U.S. representative, you would not have been able to cast a vote this weekend. But as fathers, husbands, sons, and elected leaders of this country, what would you say to your female voters who feel their concerns are not being heard? Well, Jesse, thanks for the, uh, the question, and it's an important one, and it's galvanized, I think, the American people over the last few weeks. I am the husband of a professional woman who spent her career practicing law, and I am the father of a daughter, a senior in college, who expects to go on to graduate school and become a professional as well. As an employer, uh, I tried to focus on a quality workplace, uh, both in an entrepreneurial business that I ran as well as in public companies where I've worked. I believe it's essential. So the first thing I would say is that respect quotient is important. I feel that as a dad and uh, as a uh, husband of, of a professional woman. Uh, uh, the American women witnessed a bad situation in the Kavanaugh hearings. I think Dr. Ford had a compelling case, but that case doesn't mean uh, that Brett Kavanaugh didn't deserve a fair hearing as well. In my view on the particulars of that matter, I think Dianne Feinstein should have brought that material into the committee process, into the committee staff process, in order to make sure that Dr. Ford had the proper investigation and the proper hearing in a more timely way and not wait till after the committee's action was closing. In the House, we're very sensitive to the workplace as well. And we've changed our rules in the House to make sure everyone has sexual harassment training. And I've seen to it that my staff has taken that. That effort is led by Barbara Comstock of Virginia, Sherry Bustos of Chicago, to make sure that we're setting a high standard as it relates to women in the workplace on Capitol Hill. Not a place in the past where I think that high standard has always been held, and that's why I'm glad of the work that Sherry and Barbara have been, been done, doing to make sure that we set a good example on Capitol Hill for our professional women. Mr. Hill, thank you. Mr. Swafford, two minutes. Yes. Uh, I believe that the Me Too movement was too long in coming. It should have happened long before it did. I am the son of a proud female business owner, and I was raised by many strong women, including my grandmother, who was a state employee for many years. And I think what we see in this is that the real discussion is what is appropriate. And I don't think that that should have to be asked of adult men as much as it has been. And I also think on the other side, though, that we must protect innocent until proven guilty. If somebody is proven guilty, then I want the full measure of the law extended upon them. But we have to respect our judicial process. The Kavanaugh hearing was an absolute disgrace, in my opinion. We saw the two parties go at it from 
both sides and it could not have been more messy. We should have had a more substantial hearing. We should have had one that pertained more to the Constitution and that Ms. Ford's allegations should have been heard long before that they, they actually were and they should have been presented long before that they, they actually were by um, the senators who did. So with that said, I am so happy that it happened. I've been a part of the Me Too movement. I've encouraged anybody who has been assaulted to come forward and that I would gladly help them in that process and do whatever I can to respect their right. And so with that said, I think that those are, would be my answers on the question. Mrs. Walter, thank you. Mr. Tucker, two minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question, Jesse. It's an extremely important question for our society, and it has been for several years. It's more important right now than it ever has been, given the events of the last couple weeks. First of all, I believe that every survivor of sexual assault should be respected, should be heard, and has the right to be believed. And of course, that's not saying that we shouldn't have due, due process for those that are accused. But I think we have to question whether we, what, what kind of message we're sending to women and particularly to young women in particular if they come forward with an allegation as credible and as serious as the allegation that Dr. Ford brought and to not fully investigate that allegation. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's not to say that those accused uh, aren't entitled to due process. I think it's also important to say, yes, I am a husband, I'm a father of a daughter, I'm a child of a mother, but I think it's important for the message that we're sending to young men in this country as well if we don't sufficiently investigate these allegations and what they might be able to get away with because they, they're led to believe that it's normal conduct when it absolutely is not and it, to the, when the conduct is proven to be true, it must be condemned. Um, and I, I think uh, we need to do a better job of that moving forward to make sure that survivors of sexual assault feel respected and believed and also that young men know if they engage in any activity like that, it will not be acceptable in our society. The other aspect of the Kavanaugh hearing that I believe is important is, I read this actually from a conservative journalist the other day, what he wrote is that our country is more divided right now as a result of the last week or two than we have been at any other time in our history outside of the Civil War. Now I don't know whether that's true or not, but I know that we are divided as a country and we need leaders who will help bring us together to move the country forward because that's the only chance we have against the important issues that face us. And when we have partisans in Washington on both sides pointing the fingers at the other side about what went wrong, pointing the finger here today at Dianne Feinstein, and then Repu Democrats doing the same thing, quite frankly, with Republicans. We're better than that as a country, and we need to do better in bringing the country together uh, in the future. The rebuttal is Mr. Hill's one minute, sir. Thank you, Steve. Well, I would just add that uh, I worked on the White House staff during the confirmation hearings for Justice Thomas, and it was uh, a horrific period of time that those many years ago and I watched uh, the U.S. Senate uh, turn their back on a good friend of mine, one of my closest friends, uh, John Tower, when he was in confirmation hearings in 1989 to be Secretary of Defense. So this policy of blocking nominees through sneak attacks or through uh, innuendo or unsubstantiated claims is a bad part of Washington life. I oppose it. I think we ought to step beyond that and make sure that we debate uh, judges or cabinet secretaries on their merits and not go off on uh, <coughs> innuendo or rumor. And so I've seen too much of that kind of destruction over my career, and I share uh, Representative Tucker's uh, rejection of that kind of behavior. Mr. Brawner has the next question, and it goes first to Mr. Swofford. What should be done about immigrants brought to America illegally as children? Well, thank you for the question, because this is a big and dividing issue right now in our society. I believe that there should be a path to citizenship for those who are here illegally and when they have committed no crime. I think that the children are the ones who are caught up truly in our laws right now. And their question is, what do we do? Do we send the parents home and leave them childless here on the state? Or do we accept the fact that their parents came here illegally and give them sanctuary here? I personally am not for splitting up families. I think that is reprehensible. And when we talk about the idea of our borders and what they're here to protect is individual liberty and freedom. And when someone simply, because of the inefficiencies in our immigration policy, actually comes here illegally just looking for a better life, and that's the only crime that they commit, 
They could add to our economy. They add as people to our society. And I think that we deserve it to them if we're truly anchoring our opinions and our conscience in the Constitution, that we should seek not to burden them with our extremist laws and things of that nature and actually provide them that sanctuary and not split up that family. So when it comes to the kids, I do believe they should stick with their parents and I do believe that we should provide a path to citizenship right now because we have just under 10 million illegal immigrants sitting here in the United States right now that could be adding to our economy and right now they're just afraid because of our laws right now. So. I don't believe in splitting up families. I do believe that we should leave them with their parents and provide them with a path to citizenship as we review our immigration laws and try to make them better for work visas and things of that nature. Same question to Mr. Tucker, two minutes. Thank you, Steve. Our country is in desperate need of comprehensive immigration reform, and we have been for some time now. We need comprehensive immigration reform that secures our border, strengthens our economy, and lives up to our American values. I do believe strongly that we need to make sure the border is secure to curb Ill illegal immigration in the future, and we can do that by beefing up technology, infrastructure, and personnel on the ground. We have to know who and what is coming into this country and why they're coming, and that's what's going to keep us safe. We also can have an immigration policy that actually strengthens our economy because immigrants have a lot to contribute when they come to this country with a dream of living in America. Steve Jobs, for example, was the son of a Syrian refugee. But we also need immigration policy that lives up to our American values. Unless you're a Native American, then we are all immigrants in this country. My family clearly is as well. And the young people you're referring to, the dreamers, were brought to this country through no fault of their own. I learned a story recently of a young woman who is valedictorian of her high school. And in her valedictorian speech, she announced for the first time that she was an undocumented immigrant, a dreamer. That was a very brave thing to do for that young woman. And in my opinion, she's just as American as I am. And the fact that Congress has not provided a path to citizenship yet for these young people to me is, I cannot believe that, that they have not done that yet. If I'm elected to Congress, then I wor will work very hard to make sure that the eight to 900,000 young people who were brought to this country through no fault of their own, and America is the only country they know that they do have that path to citizenship. From a purely economic standpoint, we know that it's gonna cost the country billions of dollars to force these children back to the places where they came from, and that it will contribute billions of dollars to the economy if we provide that path to citizenship. So yes, we do need that comprehensive immigration reform, and we can do it in a bipartisan way that secures our borders, strengthens our economy, and lives up to our values as America. Mr. Hill, two minutes. Thanks, Steve. Immigration is one of my biggest frustrations I've had in my uh, first two terms in Congress because we have not found that spot to fix this broken immigration system. And that, so I was very uh, surprised that when President Trump came into office and offered a pathway for DACA dreamers to have permanent residen residency status and extend uh, to citizenship, go to a merit-based immigration system and get away from only a family unification approach, remove the diversity lottery system, and then combine that with the border security promised this country during the Clinton administration that Chuck Schumer shut the government down over it. Uh, it was not the right way to go. And I was very disappointed about that. We brought two measures to the floor of the House this summer. I voted for them both because they took the status quo, which is broken, and made it better. Better for, better for the dreamers, better for border security, better for our workers who need a guest worker program with verification, the use of E-Verify, uh, better for uh, bringing our workforce together. I got that bill, uh, something added to it that's very touching to me and very important to the second congressional district. We have legal dreamers in this country, which are kids of people we've recruited to America to be engineers or doctors and work in Helena and earn a green card. And they are excluded. Technically, when they turn 21, they're supposed to be uh, sent back to their home country. I call them legal dreamers. We got President Trump to include that in our two bills that we brought to the House floor. That's what we should be doing. We remove the cap on Indian and Chinese immigrants who are here who cannot get permanent residency status for their kids because of that cap. And so I believe we do need to fix our broken immigration system, and I've voted for it. I'm committed to working on it in the next Congress. Mr. Swafford, you have one minute for rebuttal, sir. Uh, yes. 
So whenever it comes down to we're talking about dreamers and we're talking about our immigration system, we're talking about a broken system. We've all admitted to that up here. And one of the things that I would do to improve that is I would vote to and sponsor legislation to make our work visa program more efficient and easier for those who come here to actually reapply for it because most of our immigrants who are here illegal are actually here because of overstayed visas. It's not because they're actually crossing the border illegally originally. And so m that would be my solution to the problem in starting out and then move from there. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Wes Brown and goes first to Mr. Tucker. Um, Mr. Tucker, given allegations that uh, there was Russian interference in our last presidential election in 2016 and, <coughs> and the consensus that, that Russia and other countries are ramping up to interrupt our, our uh, November 6th election, what can be done to protect the integrity of our electoral process? Well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that it is absolutely imperative that we do protect the integrity of our democracy. It's critical for the future of this country. According to the president's own national security advisor, there's incontrovertible evidence that Russia interfered in the 2016 election. Whether that had an effect on the outcome of the election or not is immaterial. The fact is that they did intend and inflict damage to the process of the election in 2016. There were some sanctions placed against Russia earlier this year. I don't think Russia is really feeling those sanctions. That's a positive first step, but we absolutely have to do more to sanction Russia for interfering in the 2016 election. But quite frankly, the more important point is that we do everything in our power to protect the election system moving forward, starting with the election that's going to take place 29 days from now, the 2018 midterm elections. I know there was a bill on the House floor earlier this year to amp up uh, cybersecurity and protections in our election system for the 2018 midterm election, and the Republican majority in Congress, including Congressman Hill, voted no on that measure. I think we do need to have more protections for our election system. As I mentioned, there's nothing more important than the sanctity and integrity of our democracy because it affects every other issue that we're talking about here today. Uh, we have to reprimand those who try to interfere, and we have to do more to protect the future of, our, uh, of the integrity of our democratic system. Well, thank you, sir. Mr. Hill, two minutes. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> well, first, on this issue of protecting our own elections in this country and what Congress has done or not done, Congress has appropriated $386 million, which I voted to support, uh, and $4 million of that comes to Arkansas for election security. This is money that's essential. It was a bipartisan vote. Uh, Democrats and Republicans support election security after what we've seen in the 16 election and what we've read about and seen in testimony that Facebook, for example, has delivered before the Congress. As it relates to Russian, bad actors. Putin's a bad actor. Uh, my friend, Mr. Tucker, says that he doesn't think sanctions are biting. Sanctions are biting, Russia, I can assure you. Uh, they have losing provincial elections in Putin's party. People are protesting in the streets over the failing of their pension system there. Russia is a failed state. It's an ola run by oligarchs. Putin's a bad actor. Uh, Tom Swayze, my friend from New York, and I have a bill uh, that directs the State Department to go into Europe and provide technical assistance at cyber warfare they're conducting as they interfered with the Montenegrin elections, the Ukrainian elections. And these sanctions are bipartisan, led by Ed Royce and Elliot Engel, and they have bipartisan support on top of what the Trump administration has done. Uh, we have armed Ukraine with defensive weapons. The Obama administration would not do that. The Trump administration has authorized $150 million uh, to arm the Ukrainians to keep the pressure on Putin to get out of the Ukraine, get out of Crimea. And finally, we are unified in the House about getting Russia out of Syria and his collaboration with Assad and the Iranians to destroy five million lives in Syria. It's a disaster, and it's at the hands of the bad foreign policy of the Obama administration connected with Putin's incursion there. So we're fighting back against the Russian bear. Mr. Swafford, two minutes. So happy to be having a conversation about the integrity of elections. I wish that the Democrats and Republicans <coughs> thought so when it came to foreign countries because of how much we actually intervene in those countries and how much we manipulate everyone else's elections. It was nice to finally see them uh, show some integrity on that issue. Uh, I hate that it came down to such a <coughs> bloodbath over simple semantics, but I do think that our cybersecurity needs to be intact. 
from what I hear and from what the, the news keeps telling us, we had an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old who was actually able to hack the a simulation of the Florida electoral system just a couple months back. And so when we talk about that, we do need to be improving our cybersecurity. But at the end of the day, the ballot box is the albeit, uh, excuse me, the, the, at the end of the day, the ballot box is the truth. And if there was no tampering in any type of electro, electronic sources or anything of that nature, if it was just sway of the people, that's campaigning. The fact that a foreign country finally put their opinions in on ours after we've been doing the same for hundreds of years, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a question for sure. Mr. Hill, rebuttal. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Tucker, I'm sorry. Excuse that's okay. Me. That's okay. Thank you, Steve. No, my First of all, I think it's important to clarify that I do think sanctions against Russia are fundamental. They're vital. Um, <clears throat> apologies if I was not clear on that point. I think the sanctions that we imposed have not been sufficient to this point. Putin and Russia absolutely are bad actors. I think there are two other important points to raise here. One is that I don't believe the administration has done enough to sanction Russia. And just in general, uh, our founders created a government with th three co-equal branches of government that are supposed to provide a check and balance on each other. And that's regardless of party representation. And we need to see more out of Congress, the legislative branch, the branch of the people, to provide a check and balance on the administration when they are not serving sufficiently the interest of the American people as they have been with insufficient sanctions against Russia. And then secondly, the overwhelming influence of money in politics is something that needs to be dealt with. There's a huge aspect of that domestically, but there is a lot of foreign money that is funneled into the election process through PACs and, and corporations, as, and as the case may be, and we need to close those loopholes as well. Thank you, sir. Steve Bronner has the next question. It goes first to Mr. Hill. On September 30th, 2000, the national debt was $5.7 trillion. As of Friday, it was $21.6 trillion, and next year we'll add another trillion. Is there any reason why voting for you would reverse this trend? Thank you, Steve, for that question. You and I have talked about this, and I want to say how much I appreciate you writing from a journalist's point of view to keep the budget deficit at the forefront of uh, not only voters, but uh, elected members. I have been very disappointed with this administration's negotiating capability with the House and the Senate on the budget for FY18 and FY19. President Trump has to understand that as president, he can press for reforms in our budget process and press for reforms in our spending. And uh, my feelings about that are frustration because I had the House vote on the balanced budget amendment this year. We only had seven Democrats support it. And in the 90s, so when President Clinton was in office, we came one vote short of having a balanced budget amendment. And I think that's important because I don't know any other way now to have a cudgel to get the Congress to take the hard choices, but some ideas. One, I think uh, the President should have something that President Obama did not do, which is follow up on how to reform our spending, particularly for mandatory spending programs. Two thirds of budget is not in our domestic discretionary budget, and that reform needs to be led by the President on a bipartisan basis. That will lead us to a more fiscal path. Secondly, we need spending caps for the domestic uh, discretionary spending program. And if we have, say, caps of 2.5% plus economic growth of 3%, that will put us toward a sound fiscal footing. The reason I supported uh, this 18 and 19 budget was in the past few years, 77% of the cuts have been to defense. And I wanted to see our Defense Department rebuilt our readiness. It's very important to Little Rock Air Force Base, very important to Camp Robinson, and it's the first pay raise in eight years for our men and women in uniform. But we need structural reform, and I think a balanced budget amendment is at the heart of it. Mr. Swafford, two minutes. Yes, thank you for this question, Steve. As you and I have talked about, we're both deficit hawks. Um, I do agree with a balanced budget amendment, amendment. Even more than that, I agree with a line item balanced budget amendment that is audited every quarter because I think it is reprehensible to the trust of the American people that we have allowed this to go on for as many administrations as we have. We are $21.5 trillion in debt and it keeps climbing every day. One of the things that I support is the penny plan, which is just simply taking one penny out of every dollar that we spend and cutting it. If we can't cut 1%, then 
we should not be in charge of the purse strings like we are in Congress. And when we talk about the debt, we're really talking about irresponsibility. We're talking about a system that has been irresponsible for so many years that we've gotten to this point. And when we talk about the idea of being able to cut 1%, simply in efficiency, we should be able to do that by auditing government agencies and asking them to where we can make cuts. And even in things like the military, they say that the Pentagon itself says that we could cut up to 20%. I don't want to do that. I think that could be dangerous. But I think that we could cut 1% on efficiency alone and just make our actions a little bit better. And then with the penny plan, it says that we will be able to cut, we will be able to pay off the debt within five years because we'll actually go from running a deficit to running a surplus in that time and be able to pay off the debt. Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Steve, for the question. It is extremely critical that we do have a balanced budget in this country. I know we have to balance our budget in my family. And in the state legislature, I've, where I've served for four years, I've only ever voted and supported a balanced budget, and we have to be able to do the same thing at the federal level. As Mr. Swafford said, it is irresponsible. It, it's like a tax on our children and grandchildren, and I believe it's, it's morally wrong for us to be leaving that debt to our kids. The most recent example of exploding the deficit in recent history was the 2017 tax plan. That's going to add $1.9 trillion to the deficit within a decade. That's not to the debt, it's to the debt every year, to the deficit. It's, it's hard to comprehend that number, in my opinion. And that's from a nonpartisan congressional budget office. And we already know what the plan is going to be to balance the budget. There's a proposition on the floor of the House right now to cut Social Security by billions of dollars, to cut Medicare by half a trillion dollars, and to cut Medicaid by $1.5 trillion. I do believe we need to balance the budget, but it doesn't need to be on the backs of our seniors who have paid in to Social Security and Medicare for their entire lives, and it doesn't need to be for huge handouts to billionaires and, and the largest corporations in the United States. I do believe uh, the tax bill was misplaced. I, there are some parts of it, and we may talk more about it in the future, but the parts of it that support working families, I, I do support that. But um, the, to explode the deficit on the backs of Social Security and Medicare is wrong, and we need to do better in the future. I agree with Mr. Hill that we, we do need, uh, it is critical for our military and for our safety and for security. For Little Rock Air Force Base and Camp Robinson, men and women in uniform deserve a pay raise, but we can do it. The way not to do it is to explode the deficit, to have tax handouts to billionaires and the largest corporations in the United States. The rebuttal is Mr. Hills. Thanks, Steve. First on that <coughs> point, uh, there are estimates that say that of the 1.7 trillion over 10 years is expected from the CBO projects, that between 40 and 80 percent of that has been earned back based on the CBO original projections because of the faster economic growth than CBO projected. So I think growth is an essential component to budget deficit reduction, structural reform deficit, and we are getting 4 percent growth now in this economy, not 1.8 we had under President um, Obama. And individual income tax re 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 uh, receipts this year are 8 percent higher than they were last year. So I think our Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is working for uh, the financial growth essential to f fiscal growth in the future. I support my uh, SSDI reforms, Social Security Disability reforms, and I support this 1% plan that Joe referenced. I voted for it each time uh, along the way in the House, and I have voted for a balanced budget consistently in my time in Congress. I will continue to fight for that when I'm reelected. Next question from uh, Wes Brown goes first to Mr. Swafford. Mr. Swafford, President Trump has uh, uh, imposed trade tariffs of up to uh, more than a half a trillion dollars on China and some of our top allies. I want to ask you, is this a winnable trade policy for the United States long term? Um, thank you for the question very much. This is something I'm very passionate about. I think tariffs are an awful response to our trade problems right now. A tariff is simply a tax, and all taxes are eventually paid by the consumer. And when I talk to the farmers here in Arkansas that due to the tariffs, they have soybean fields that are chest high that they can't sell to China right now because of the tariffs. Or we have steel workers who are out of jobs now because of the tariffs. And it's simply vanity. That's all it is. We could be sponsoring the lowering of cost of living through tax reform right now to be able to trade on the open market internationally. And we're not doing that. We are taking a warlike stance against these, uh, or against these pressures from, international, from the international community, excuse me. And we're trying to fight back 
in this tit-for-tat type of system. And I don't agree with it at all. Uh, as my background in economics tells me, and as I've said before, a tariff is a tax, and all taxes are eventually paid by the consumer. And in this district, our farmers and our blue-collar workers are hurting because of those tariffs. And I would vote to end them if given the chance. Mr. Tucker, two minutes. One important part of this conversation is the USMCA agreement that is in the process of replacing the NAFTA agreement that was uh, enacted 26 years ago. We have seen a, a, a few changes that are positive. For one, there's a greater incentive to manufacture automobiles and automobile parts here in North America, hopefully in the United States. And we also see more of an emphasis on labor protections. For example, there's a requirement that a certain percentage of workers have to be paid at least $16 per hour. I have always believed that if we, in our trade agreements, if we level the playing field for the American worker, then our jobs will stay here in the United States because there's no country that can outperform the American workers that we have here at home. So I do uh, praise those changes. I think some of the goals in the tariffs may not be uh, all bad. For example, as I just said, making sure that we prioritize jobs here at home and having a level playing field for the American worker. I don't think that the way in which we've gone about it is the best way to do it. Tariff by tweet is the way I like to describe it. It needs to be a very thoughtful and multilateral process. Uh, the, the way that we have gone about it has too much of a burden and too much of an impact on our farmers here in Arkansas. I was just having a conversation with a farmer over the weekend, and the conversation was similar to what Joe's describing. On the day that the tariffs were announced, the value of our soybeans, the number one row crop that we export, went down by 14%. Uh, of course, Canada and Mexico are our two uh, biggest trading partners here in Arkansas, so the USMCA is positive for that. But China and other countries are major export countries for our agricultural products, and we can have trade agreements if we approach them in a thoughtful, deliberative, and multilateral way that provide a level playing field for American workers, for the environment, that incentivize jobs here in America, but without the devastating effects on our farmers and our producers here in Arkansas that need to be able to sell our products throughout the world. We can have free trade at the same time that we have fair trade. Same question, Mr. Hill, two minutes. Thank you. Well, I have a uh, background in uh, trade back in uh, 1992 during the original work on NAFTA. I was a staffer at that time. I'm generally a, a very strong supporter of free trade across this country. I think since World War II, America and our friends in Great Britain have led uh, the free trade effort to move capitalism, market-based capitalism across this world. It's left billions of people better off with more food, better products, better services, higher standards of living. So I believe strongly in free trade, and I think it's essential. With that said, I hear this work uh, about uh, China. China is the bad actor here. They were admitted into the World Trade Organization in 2001, and I think in retrospect, that's a problem. They're the ones who put up protectionist boundaries against the EU, Canada, Mexico, and the US. They're the ones who are asserting a protectionist view. President Trump wanted to reset trade. So he says, we're going to go after China. We're going to compel them to change their mercantilistic policies. And he's doing that through the threat of tariffs. No president has done that before. We haven't ever tried it in this way before. So it is having uh, uh, some negative residual effects on our farmers, and we should be concerned about that. And his steel and aluminum tariffs across the board, I oppose. He knows I've opposed them. I have a different approach to that because that's hurting Tokusin right here in Conway and their manufacturing that make intermediate goods with the metals, aluminum, and steel. It's hurting employment in the U.S. We can tackle steel and aluminum tariffs a different way, and if we do, we get Japan, the EU, Canada, and Mexico on our side to compel China to change their policy. Together, we're about 35% of two-way trade with China. That they will listen to. I do congratulate the president on getting uh, the NAFTA deal rebooted. We look forward to reading that. And I do congratulate him for his work uh, supporting free trade bilateral with Korea, Japan, and soon the UK. Mr. Swafford, one minute. Yes. Um, as I talked about, I'm against the tariffs because unlike most of the politicians that are gonna be on your debate stage this election, I'm one of you, I'm one of the working class. <clears throat> and Maybe we can talk about exploring ideas and solutions, but when we're exploring those ideas and those solutions and it causes job loss and it causes 
wage reduction and farmers not to be able to make their living, I don't think that that should be a part of the process. I don't think that those are casualties that are somehow worth the results that we're going to get. And as a result of that, I think that this has been a dangerous exploration into international trade. What we can do here at home is lower the cost of living through tax and budget reform and <coughs> allow us to compete on the open market and actually beat China at its own game and any other country for the simple fact that we will be able to produce a product cheaper and better. And that is the true American dream and that is the power of the American economy. We just have to unleash it. Thank you, sir. Next question, Ms. Turnour goes first to Mr. Tucker. The state's unemployment rate is low, but there are still working Arkansans who struggle to make ends meet. At the state level, voters will be able to decide in November whether to raise the minimum wage to $11 an hour by 2021. So I kind of have a two-parter question here. First, do you support that ballot measure? And then what would you support in Congress to address this issue back home? Yes, you're right. Unemployment is low, and that's great, but it does mask poor wages for hardworking people in Arkansas. I do believe that if you work full time in this country, you ought to be able to afford life's basic needs. And there are too many people right now who work full time, sometimes more jobs than one, and still can't afford life's basic needs, still can't afford to put food on the table, buy the medicine that they need, and buy health care. And so one part of that is we need jobs that pay better. There are a whole lot of factors that go into that. One essential factor is a living, a living wage, a decent minimum wage. The current federal standard is $7.25 an hour. The state standard is $8.50 an hour. That's not enough. Yes, there are young people who work those jobs, but there are tens of thousands of parents in this state who work jobs at a minimum wage level and they simply cannot afford to support their families at those wages. So yes, I do support the state measure. Issue five to raise the minimum wage here in Arkansas to $11 an hour uh, responsibly over a period of years between now and 2021. As for a federal minimum wage, I do think it, it does obviously need to be raised from $7.25 an hour. I don't support putting it, um, having a one size fits all minimum wage across the entire country. The cost of living in New York City and Manhattan is far different than it is in Little Rock, Searcy, Conway, and the other communities that we have here in central Arkansas. And so for that reason, I do think there should be different standards based on cost of living throughout the country. I do believe it's, it's important when we do adjust the minimum wage that we index it to inflation. Because once we set it every year that it does not go up, it's a pay cut for these hardworking Arkansas families. My priority is to make sure that we have an economy that lifts everyone up, that people who work hard in this country can afford to support their families. And for that reason, so long as we do it in a responsible way, as issue five does, we should support an increase in the minimum wage to make sure that our hardworking Arkansas families get the raise that they deserve. We go to Mr. Hill, two minutes. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks, Jesse, for the question. I don't support the uh, proposal on the Arkansas ballot. My experience with the minimum wage has been that uh, two comments. One, I think the legislature, if they <coughs> want to adjust the minimum wage from time to time, they ought to keep that power to themselves and do that legislatively and not uh, kick it to a ballot initiative for the voters. I think changing it and hardwiring in that doesn't facilitate uh, different labor markets in the state doesn't facilitate different economic times. And so I don't pr uh, propose uh, to support it. And it also is dis, uh, not competitive with minimum wages around uh, the state. With that said, for the three and a half years I've been in Congress, I've worked as co-chairman of the Skilled Workforce Congress uh, Caucus with my friend Brenda Lawrence from Michigan. And we've been focused on how to get high wage jobs through uh, apprenticeships and partnerships between industry and K through 12 education and with our community colleges. I've also uh, served as vice chairman of the Historically Black Colleges and University Caucus. Those two areas allow me to focus on getting training through our education system to get people more skills so that they have the ability to earn a higher wage based on their success and their productivity. We should be trying to get a maximum wage for all people. Uh, I've seen that work time and time again in my 35-year business career. I was uh, door knocking the other day and came across a woman who runs a nonprofit in Little Rock, and she does uh, child development work, and she's very much opposed to the minimum wage increase. She says, I don't know how I can afford that in my fixed nonprofit budget uh, with the work that I do. My ability to get reimbursed for that's not going to go up from Medicaid. So this is a problem for her, and I think it's a problem a lot of entrepreneurs for-profit and not-for-profit face. So I think we should focus on a better education system. People can read, people can work, people have the skills 
uh, to either change careers or have a good career when they get out of school. Mr. Swafford, two minutes. Yes. Thank you for the question, Jesse. I'm against the amendment to add to the, to the state minimum wage. And the reason I say that is that the burden it's going to put on our businesses is going to be exponential. And we're just going to be back here again in a couple of years because of our dangerous fiscal policy causing mass inflation across the country. But what I would like to do is to give everybody a raise and to raise everyone's wages. And the way I do that is from my small business background and my economics perspective, there's two ways that we can actually increase profit and profit being your wages as a citizen. We can either increase revenue or we can cut costs. Through tax reform and through better budgeting at the federal level, we can actually decrease the cost of living, giving everybody a wage increase and giving everybody more individual financial freedom without actually raising the minimum wage to where that wage actually means more. So we would be giving a raise, we just wouldn't be doing it through a mandate that hurt our businesses. It would actually help us across all planes for the simple fact that our goods and services would go down for the simple fact of the tax burden going down. And for that reason, I, sub I am against this, but I am for raising the wages of all people in America, and the way to do that, though, is through tax reform. Mr. Tucker, one minute rebuttal. Yes, sir. Thank you, Steve. I do agree with Congressman Hill that we, we need to have better ways for high wage jobs, for people to have access to college and career technical education and apprenticeships with organized labor, and also with having an infrastructure system in this country that sets us up for economic development in the future, including access to high speed internet. But I do think you'll see a clear contrast between Congressman Hill and myself on this issue. Uh, for example, the tax bill that I referenced that Congressman Hill supported last year, the 83 percent of the benefit of that went to people who earn more than $400,000 per year. My priority is to make sure that people who work in this country can't afford life's basic needs. And I understand the impact on small business. My wife had a business for seven years that she ran, but she also agreed with the fundamental principle that if you work full time in this country, you ought not to live in poverty. You ought to be able to afford food and medicine. And uh, this is the way to help us go about getting there, along with the other policies that we mentioned to set people up for better paying jobs in the future. Gentlemen, we thank you for your answers to the questions so far, and we thank our panel for posing them. We are now at the point in uh, this evening's proceedings for closing arguments. And uh, again, as was determined prior to tonight's uh, debate, we begin with Mr. Swafford. Yes. Thank you again to AETN. Thank you for our panel. Uh, the questions have been great. As you may have noticed on some of the questions, I probably wasn't as shined and polished as Congressman Hill or Representative Tucker here. And that's because I'm one of you. I haven't spent my life preparing for this. I ran because I felt I needed to. I felt that it was just for the people and that I could serve my country in that way because these two-party politics aren't working. We go from one side to the other and nothing ever really gets done. The debt increases, jobs go down, we're back here again. And so for that reason, I have stumbled some bit on my answers and just then right now. But I hope you see it as genuine. I hope you see it as I'm one of you. I'm here to listen to you. My bosses, if I go to Washington, are three things, and that is the Constitution, my constituents, and my conscience. And everybody else, including big interest and big party players, can kick rocks. And that's exactly how I feel about it. I will listen to you, I will come to you, and I will allow a level of transparency that you haven't seen before out of a representative for the simple fact that I want you to be able to be involved in the politics that are defining you and your children's life. And I don't think that that has been shown here uh, by anybody but me. And for those reasons, I hope that whenever you look at the ballot box, you'll look for change and that you'll vote for me. Vote Joe Liberty, and thank you again to everybody. Mr. Swaver, thank you. Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to Jesse, Steve, and <coughs> Wesley, and also to Congressman Hill. And Joe, for being here tonight, I would love to do this again. And thanks again for everyone for being here, but most importantly to you for tuning in. Healthcare is the issue more than any other that compelled me to run for Congress this year. Serving in the legislature, I, I played a critical role in preserving Medicaid expansion here in Arkansas, which has brought health care to nearly 300,000 people in this state, many of whom for the first time in their lives. 
We also know that while the Affordable Care Act is not perfect and needs to be improved, that it did provide essential protections for people with pre-existing conditions. We also know that the American Health Care Act passed last year in the, in, the, in the House, fortunately it did not become law, would have essentially dismantled this innovative bipartisan pro Medicaid expansion program in Arkansas that has provided health care to 280,000 people, and it would have removed critical protections for people with pre-existing conditions in this state, not only because you could have been charged more for having a pre-existing condition, but also because insurance companies could exclude coverage for whatever your pre-existing condi condition might be. For me, that pre-existing condition is cancer. And in the moment I was diagnosed, my family's life changed forever. And that's when I knew I had to run for this office to make sure that we have a member of Congress who understands that in this world, health comes first. You can't work or take care of your family unless you have access to health care, and that every person in this country should have access to quality, affordable health care. It still is not an easy decision to run for Congress because you know that you and your family are going to be subject to malicious and false attacks. But every day I get to get up and go out and visit with voters. And I hear from them and their stories, and I learn very quickly, I'm reminded every day, that this campaign is not about me. <clears throat> it's about them. It's about everyone here in central Arkansas, in the whole state, and in the entire country. That's the kind of campaign that we're running. It's a recognition that it's not divisive Washington politics of the past. It's a recognition that cancer, hunger, and hopes and dreams do not have a political party. We're running a campaign not based on fear, but on inspiration, and I hope you'll join us and be a part of it. Thank you very much. Mr. Tucker is thanked. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Steve, and I want to thank uh, my colleagues for being with me today, and also uh, UCA and ATN and our uh, questioners today. Thank you for your participation. What I'd like to say to the voters of the 2nd uh, District are, you're better off today than you were two years ago. Little Rock Air Force Base is better off than they were two years ago with full funding on our national defense bill. Four new C-130Js coming to the base, a 2.4% increase. Our K-12 education system is better off than it was two years ago. We passed the first uh, reauthorization of our K-12 education since 2001 in this house. Our Children's Hospital is better off than it was two years ago because we have a 10-year authorization for CHIP fully funded and fully offset for our kids who are treated at Children's Hospital. Our veterans are better off than they were two years ago because we have the accountability now to fire people at the VA who don't deliver the service to our vets that they deserve. That's the kind of work that I'm proud of in the last two years. Our economy is better off. 4% growth as opposed to 1.8% during the eight years of the Obama administration. Lowest unemployment in 50 years. Most business enthusiasm by the NFIB since it started in the 1970s. In this race, voters of our district have a choice. Do you want to send me back to Washington to fight for our vets, fight for our priorities, or do you want to send one of these gentlemen to Washington? I urge you to consider voting for me. My opponent, Mr. Tucker, has proposed a Medicare plan that I think would lead to a faster bankruptcy of Medicare that he's campaigned on. He doesn't know uh, what ICE is, and I support law enforcement. He's for bigger government and higher taxes. And his campaign is at the heart of it, financed by the Washington Democrats. Vote for me for re-election, please. Mr. Hill, thank you. Mr. Swafford, Mr. Tucker as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the candidates for Congress at Arkansas's second congressional district. Thank you all in our audience and at home once again, our candidates and our panel. Good night. Major funding for Election 2018 AETN Debates is provided by AARP Arkansas.